I put on the board, I'm going to talk to, uh, this afternoon about um, uh, an aspect of federalism, and I'm going to talk about the size and scale of political order. Not, not size of government, but of the state itself, uh, France, Iceland, uh, United States, the si size of a state, uh, and how that relates to the market and to our question. I've put on the board uh, schemes of ratio of representation to population, and I'll talk about those. David Hume, in his uh, Constitutional Republic, has one representative for every 900 people. Madison says there should be one for every 30,000 people. In the United States today, it's one for every, wait a minute, sorry. I was having an hallucination here, apparently. One for every 725,000 people. That's what we have. Doesn't look too good, does it? Um, and New Hampshire has one for every 3,000 people. California has one for every 475,000 people. Um, and here are the number of representatives in these various schemes. Hume has 10,000 representatives in his constitution. Madison has 60 in the House of Representatives. U.S. Has, today has 435. That'll make more sense as we go along. But I put those figures up. Uh, you can look at them from time to time. Is government the problem, or is the free market the problem? Now, before answering this question, we need to ask, what do we mean by government? Ever since the Greeks invented political philosophy some 2,600 years ago, there have been two incompatible conceptions of what government is and ought to be. I shall take the ancient, now there have been many kinds of governments and theories of governments, but I think they boil down to two basic metaphysical frameworks. I shall take the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle as a symbol of one view, and the 17th century English philosopher Thomas Hobbes as a symbol of the other. Uh, there's no attempt here to be historically accurate. These are styles of thinking uh, that these two thinkers symbolize, I think, be uh, better than any other two I can think of. Now, the Aristotelian theory holds that the basic nature of man is social. The need for government grows out of this social nature. And the task of government is basically to preserve and to help perfect the potentialities to excellence in an inherited social order. Just as medicine seeks to preserve and perfect the excellences uh, of health in the body. A uh, political society is inherited, just like your constitution is. The, the Hobbesian theory is entirely different. It holds that man's nature is not social, but is radically egoistic. Each individual is governed by an insatiable desire to pursue his own power and glory without limit. And you can compare this to Galileo's principle of inertia. In other words, each individual for Hobbes, for the Hobbesian, uh, moves in a straight line of self-gratification unless acted upon by an outside force. Well, the result is collision, war, and violent death, if that's, our, if that's our basic nature. Now, the only way out of this miserable natural condition of anarchy is for a powerful will, either an individual or a group, to emerge, which can strike fear into the hearts of individuals and command obedience. When that happens, individuals, through rational self-interest, mutually agree to lay down their natural right to unlimited egoism in favor of obedience to this powerful will to rule over them. Now, the rules imposed uh, are, uh, by this will are motivated by the interests of the ruler, not the ruled. But they nevertheless 
as crude as they might be, open up a sphere of peace and stability whereby individuals can pursue their own egoistic interests without constant fear of a violent death. And this condition uh, we may call civil association, the sphere of peace and stability that's opened up uh, by this powerful will commanding obedience is civil association. Now a further difference between the two visions of the political is that for the Aristotelian, there is a presumption that political society should be small, very small. Uh, for the Hobbesian, there is a presumption that it should be large, very large. His book is entitled Leviathan, Giant. Now, why is this? Radical differences. The Aristotelian policy aims at human excellence in the character of the individual and in society. That means there must be a common vision of the human good uh, and a public sphere in which excellence can be displayed, critically evaluated, and emulated by the young. Now that requires face-to-face -face knowledge or something very close to it, which places a natural limit on the size because there's a size to the human frame and what we can recognize and talk to and all the rest of it. Plato, for example, suggested a polity of around 5,000 uh, male citizens. If you add women, children, slaves, and foreigners, you have a polity of around 30 to 40,000 people. Other Aristotelians, and here I'm treating Plato as if he were an Aristotelian, uh, <laughs> have argued for a larger number of people. Later we'll examine some of these other views about a larger kind of polity. But you can see how small these, these things are, or uh, that they are small. Now, in the Hobbesian polity, human beings are naturally in a state of anarchy until an all-powerful will oppose, imposes order and generates civil association. Consequently, given two Hobbesian regimes, let's say, one ruling a million people and another ruling 10 million people, the latter is superior to the former because the sphere of civil, civil association is greater. The sphere of peace and stability is greater. The more number, there's a greater number. So, <clears throat> intimated uh, and logically contained, oh, sorry, uh, let me, that's another point. Okay, now that would solve the problem of uh, anarchy within the territory of, of these, these two polities, but one would be superior to the other. However, between the two polities, the state of nature would still exist, wouldn't it? The state of anarchy would exist between these two polities. Well, that's not good. So ideally, locked into the uh, logic of the Hobbesian regime, they should be unified under one powerful will. Then we would have 30, now what do I say, uh, 10, uh, we'd, have, we'd have 11 million people in civil association. So logically contained in Hobbesian political theory is the intimation of a single world government, which would be the final solution to the problem of anarchy. Now, of course, there may be practical difficulties in establishing a world government, and it might be practically impossible, but that is the ideal intimated in the logic of the Hobbesian notion of government. Failing world government, one should extend the sphere of civil association as far as possible. Better to have 50 American states than the original 13. George W. Bush administration toyed with the idea of a North American Union of Canada, Mexico, and the United States, similar to the European Union. Better to have one large, centralized, Hobbesian North American Union than three sovereign states in a condition of anarchy with each other. Now, the moral demand of the Hobbesian for larger and larger centralized states brings out a, what I shall call a theological dimension to the Hobbesian theory. 
Uh, I'm going to say that theology is at bottom the study of human misery and how to achieve salvation from it. For the Hobbesian, the cause of human misery um, is the anarchy of the state of nature. And the invention of government via an all-powerful will is the solution to the problem of salvation insofar as man is capable of his own salvation. Insofar as that's capable, government is the solution. Because human anarchy is the source of misery. Let me explain more about the theological dimension of Hobbes, of the Hobbesian. God is understood to have uh, the metaphysical properties of indivisibility, infallibility, omnipotence, and benevolence. The Hobbesian takes these properties that belong to God and maps them on conceptually to the state, which is now thought of as politically infallible, omnipotent, indivisible, and the source of a general benevolence. <clears throat> now, this is not to say that people can't criticize the state and all the rest of it, but they see the state as the sphere of hope, and, as, as that, that place of hope and fear in which to which the mind is naturally and heart is attracted. <clears throat> Hobbes described the state as that, quote, immortal God, because it outlasts every generation. Hegel called the state, quote, that veritable God on earth, end quote. One cannot overemphasize this theological dimension of the state, which grips the mind, minds of all Hobbesians. And there were Hobbesians before Hobbes. Uh, as a symbol. And this is true whether these Hobbesians are theists or atheists, whether they are right-wing Hobbesians or left-wing Hobbesians, because we have both kinds. For, for example, the Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. flag is to a nation one and indivisible. Indivisible. That is to attribute a divine property, indivisibility, and absolute sovereignty to the central government of the United States. Uh, but you see, nothing in human affairs, and especially politics, is, is indivisible. So we are thinking of the central government of the United States as having absolute sovereignty and being, uh, having these divine properties. And, the, and people who think this way are thinking theologically about the government, even though they may be atheists. It is no accident, then, that the United States tends to see itself as having a divine mission in the world. And you see this a lot, to spread, to spread global democracy or uh, to make the world safe for democracy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are global missions that spring from a Hobbesian disposition uh, to think about government in a certain way. Now, this theological conception of the state with its intimations of world government is foreign to the Aristotelian polity because it does not define government as salvation. It does not define it as the solution to the problem of anarchy, because given the social nature of man, anarchy, for the Aristotelian, is not a universal condition. And so is not the fundamental problem of politics. The Aristotelian polity aims at achieving human excellence in the individual and in the public realm of society. Now, since political society for the Aristotelian is a natural thing that develops over time, like a natural language, uh, no one planned the English language, there were no founding fathers, there was no committee that worked out the syntax and the grammar. This thing spontaneously developed over time by people communicating with each other. Uh, and the like, and there's a thing called English. It's a natural thing. Well, government is the same way. Society is the same way. It grows naturally. <clears throat> it might happen uh, for the Aristotelian that a profound disagreement would arise over the nature of human excellence, especially if you've got a lot of people in one place, in which case a natural division of society would be recommended. Consequently, the Aristotelian regime is naturally divisible. It's not indivisible. It is naturally 
divisible. It might not be divided, because there might be no, be no read, need for it, but there could be a need for it, and it, it is divisible. The Hobbesian regime is not divisible. It's indivisible. If you divide it, you're opening the door to anarchy. So you can look at it this way. <laughs> in nature, uh, the, human, human, the human cells grow. Uh, they're replaced, you know, they die and all. But they grow to a point. Um, if they, if they get to a point where they split and divide. If they, don't, they don't just keep growing. They split and divide. <laughs> and so this can happen to political societies. The cancerous cell has lost the knowledge of how to divide. It just keeps growing. So I'm going to later argue that the Hobbesian state is kind of like a cancer. It doesn't know when to stop growing. It has no way to know that it's no longer hungry. OK, we can now see that our original question, is the problem government or the free market, is indeterminate. Are we thinking of government under the Hobbesian conception of small states, or are we thinking of government under the Hobbesian, what did I say? Are we thinking of government under the Aristotelian conception of small states, or under the Hobbesian conception of large states? I probably need a keeper up here, you know, so somebody watch out if I go crazy, would lose my place. And by the free market, do we mean a market operating under an Aristotelian conception of government? Because you don't have a market without government. Or are we thinking of the free market under a Hobbesian conception of government? Those will be, those will be quite different conceptions of the market and quite different conceptions of the intrusion of government because we have incommensurable notions of government. Now, these two, division, these two visions of the government and of the markets they generate are incompatible. I'd like to illustrate this by discussing how the two theories uh, conceive of republican government. For when we think of government's relation to the free market, we usually today think of republican government. Indeed, most every country in the world today defines itself as a republic, right? I mean, most all of them are republics. But there's a world of difference between the Republic of Iceland with 300,000 people and the American Republic of 315 million people, not to mention the People's Republic of China with 1 billion 300 million. Mm. Iceland's a republic and so is China. You see the problem. This, this is prattle, prattle, to talk, to talk, to describe these two things as republics. Um, so let's look at this notion of republicanism. <clears throat> now, to appreciate this difference and how size uh, in republicanism makes all the difference, we need to go back in history some 2,500 years to Greek civilization where republics first appeared. Until the French Revolution, republics were generally held to have three essential characteristics. Now, I'm painting with a broad brush here, and I'm simplifying, but that just has to be done. The first characteristic is that republican government is one in which the citizens make the laws they live under. The second is they cannot make just any law. The legislation they make must conform to a more fundamental law which they do not make, but which they know through tradition. And the third principle is the republic must be small. Must be small. Now, you and I are used to the first two when we think of republicanism. Yes, we're government of the people and rule of law, but we've forgotten the third. We just have forgotten the third. So that's what I want to talk about now. But what is meant by small? Aristotle said he doesn't give us a size, as Plato does, but he says the size of a republic should be determined by the function of politics. What's that? 
Well, it's to achieve justice, security, economic prosperity, and a high degree of human excellence. Well, how many people do you need for that in association? You might be surprised to learn that for over 2,000 years, republics seldom went beyond 200,000 people. And most were considerably smaller. The ancient, medieval, and early modern republics were in that range, more or less, and they produced brilliant cultures. Athens was one of the largest Greek republics. It gave us Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, great architecture, drama, science, sculpture. <clears throat> and um, at the death of, of Alexander, it had a population speculated to be somewhere between 170 and 258,000, depending on the historian. Let's just say 200,000. The Republic of Florence, with a population of around 80,000, was a leader in the Italian Renaissance, giving us Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Machiavelli, world-class architecture, and modern banking. Venice was another illustrious republic with a population of around 180,000. It was the cultural center of Europe in the 17th century. What this 2,000-year history of republican government reveals is that a population of around 200,000 or less is all that is needed to produce a flourishing political society at a high degree of human excellence. That's all you need. And that's just the way, it, I mean, that's a fact. That's not a philosopher's utopia, that's just a fact about the human business. Now, to say this, however, is not to say that there could not be a republic larger, and I will talk about larger republics, um, but that it doesn't have to be. And secondly, it's not to say that these republics were uh, self-sufficient. Hardly any state is self-sufficient. And the smaller the state, the more dependent it is on trade with other states to secure the goods it cannot produce. Uh, that's why small states tend to promote free trade and believe in free trade principles more than large ones. <clears throat> Many believe that a large centralized Hobbesian state is needed for economic prosperity. That the Hobbesian state is a solution to the economic, uh, sorry, is a solution to economic salvation as well as political. Everybody wants to get, uh, all the states want to get in the EU in that region of the world, because their, their political life depends on it, they think. But that is not true. Economic integration does not necessarily require political integration. Norway's population is 5 million, Switzerland is 8 million, Iceland's population is a little over 300,000. All three, by US standards, are very small, yet each is economically integrated with the entire world. But none of them are politically integrated with any other country. None is a member of the Hobbesian European Union. Yet all three are in the top 10 wealthiest uh, states by per capita income in the world as of last year. Indeed, except for Germany, all the top 10 richest were small. Denmark, Luxembourg, uh, and others. So states don't have to be large politically, and they don't have to be large uh, economically. But could you have an entire civilization of large states? I mean, maybe you can have a few mar just a few small states, large states. Sorry. I do need a keeper. Could you have a civilization of small states, a whole civilization, not just a few here or there, tucked in around the large ones? You might think not, because when you look at history, it seems to be the story of large centralized empires. Everywhere you look, you see the Egyptian Empire, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Roman, the Mongols, the Aztecs, the Incas, the British, the Soviet Union, and so on. It looks like empire is the natural way to go. But ancient Greek civilization is the great exception. It was composed 
of some 1,500 small republics uh, strung out with no central authority, strung out from Naples to the Black Sea. Each republic was jealous of its political liberty and was in competition with the others for wealth and recognition. Yet they formed a coherent civilization. In Hobbesian terms, it was a civilization in a state of anarchy. Right? So it was a civilization in anarchy, as far as Hobbes is concerned, because there was no central government to unify it. In it, we see not only market competition in producing and exchanging commodities, but market competition between governments in producing culture, justice, and experiments in achieving human excellence. So we have, we have market competition in governments as well as economic exchange. Our notions of liberty, individual and political liberty, are, are, are rooted uh, to some degree in this highly decentralized, unique Greek civilization. Now it's true it was eventually conquered by Alexander the Great and later by the Romans, but great empires also collapse. They don't last very long. And decentralized Greek civilization lasted as long as most empires. Remember, all things political must die. Well, it's like us. They're, they're not centers of salvation. They're tied together with mortal cords, all of them. And they're not indivisible. And even after the Greeks were conquered, their civilization produced, um, was, was long the teacher of the Roman Empire and later of European Christian civilization. So they produce a brilliant civilization who, that's in, the influence is still around today. Well, what about defense? The Persian Empire in 490 BC was a regime estimated at some 50 million. The Greeks numbered around 8 million in 1,500 tiny little republics scattered about. Surely the massive Persian Empire could pick these off one by one, but it was never able to do so. The explanation Greek leaders gave for this achievement was the kind of character developed in their republican forms of government. They like to say, we are Greeks, we know how to rule and how to be ruled. The Persians know only how to submit or how to rule. The, the emperor knows how to rule, the rest know how to submit. Uh, the Venetian, here's another republic that, that uh, was able to last. The, the Venetian state, known as the Serene Republic, maintained its independence for 1,200 years before being conquered by Napoleon. Switzerland was founded in 1291 and has preserved its independence in Europe, in a Europe of, of large states torn by almost constant war. So small, small countries can survive and flourish. Nevertheless, there are circumstances in which a larger polity could provide greater safety, and this poses the question of whether we could have a republic larger than the Aristotelian size, which I have pegged at around 200,000. The problem is how to expand the size of the republic without losing uh, the virtues of small human scale. Can you do that? The only way this could be done if at all, would be through a federation of the small republics arranged so as to create a central authority with limited power and preserving, reserving uh, all the uh, powers necessary for republican government to the units. Now, the, the constitution for such a federation was first framed in Christian civiliz the Christian civilization of medieval Europe. Uh, the Greeks had alliances and leagues, but they, they never worked out um, this kind of federated polity, but the, the Christians did. Medieval civilization was like Greek civilization in being highly decentralized. There were thousands of independent political societies, republics, dukedoms, principalities, free cities, leagues of free cities. Whereas Greek civilization had a common language, Christendom did not. Yet it had a common religion with a common head, uh, the Pope. But whereas other civilizations, including the Greeks and Romans, united the religious and secular authority, Christians divided them. In these respects, 
The civilization of Christendom was a larger scale and contained a greater variety of cultures than that of the Greeks. But it was decentralized as a civilization. Now, it's from this civilization that we inherited the universities. That's where we get the universities. The ethic of individualism, the ideal of the rule of law, the ideal of the romantic, um, the parliamentary system, trial by jury, the institutions of capitalism, the sheriff, the mayor, and all of those other institutions. Pretty good for the dark ages, wouldn't you say? Medieval civilization also gave us the idea of how to federate small polities into a larger one without losing much in the way of Republican virtue. And the thinker I would like to use to symbolize this is uh, he's in the seventh, late 17th century, uh, uh, late 16th century, early 17th century, uh, but he sums up this, this uh, medieval inheritance, which is to be found all over the place in Europe. His name is Johannes Althusius, Althusius a German thinker, and he wrote a book called Politica, 1614. Liberty Fund has a, 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 a list of it you can buy, it's cheap, and, and uh, you might want to read it. Now, Althusius presents a federation of small states described as being, he says, of, quote, medium size. It's going to be larger than the Aristotelian Republic, but it's not going to be as big as a kingdom. It's going to be of medium size. A country about the size of Switzerland. I would say. Switzerland is a little over half the territorial size of South Carolina. It gives you an idea how big it is. And it's composed of 26 sovereign states, not counties. American counties are not states. Switzerland is made up of 26 states, sovereign states. Um, and uh, these states are of about the Aristotelian size, uh, not all of them, but uh, there are 26 of them, and 20 of those states are 300,000 in population or less. That's, that's close to what we were talking about as classical. 12 of those states are 100,000 or less, and one of the states is 15,000, and there's one that's over a million. Now, one of the interesting things about Althusius' federation of states is the right of secession. Um, you've got to have some way of protecting uh, the states uh, and their republican virtues from being absorbed by the center. Now, a century, over a century after Althusius, a Scottish philosopher named David Hume did Althusius one better by providing us with the model of an even larger federative republic, lots of little republics, on a larger scale, the size, he says, of Britain or France. So now we're talking about tens of millions of people federated in a kind of republican idiom. This was the first, I think, the first uh, attempt to lay out such a polity, 1752. Some 30 years after Hume's essay, the Americans presented the world not with a theory, but with an actual federative polity of continental scale. Not France, but much bigger than that, as far as territory goes. But Americans were not at all sure that a federation of this unprecedented size could preserve the virtues of, of, the, of the Republican tradition. We forget about this, but they were worried about that because there had never been anything like that. There had been federations. The Holy Roman Empire, what you could say, was a federation. But it's a federation of principalities. But here was a federation of republics. Well, that's a different thing altogether. Um, and they worried about it. <clears throat> The Republican tradition taught them that if the territory and population were too large, that, that it would turn into a centralized monarchy type system, whether they liked it or not. It doesn't matter whether they want to be Republicans. If they're going to rule this baby, uh, they're going to end up with a centralized regime. But there was a solution. Although the territory was of monarchical scale, an imperial scale, the population was sparse. Wasn't anybody there? 
to speak of. Americans enjoyed Republican self-government on a scale actually smaller than the ancient Greeks. For example, the largest city in 1776 was Philadelphia with only 30,000 people. New York did not reach the size of ancient Athens at 200,000, uh, we might say, until 1830. So when Lincoln was 20 years old, New York was about the size of ancient Athens. Today it's 8 million. So how did America, so when Americans think of, talked about republicanism and the people and rule of the people, they're thinking of a world and a human scale that, that, that we can't even, under, you know, we, we have to get our minds around it. So how did Americans think they were going to reconcile small republicanism with the vast territory? They did so like Althusius by building secession through territorial division into the concept of the Ameri of American conception of liberty. Now Virginia led the way on this. Virginia had conquered the vast Northwest Territory, which includes today the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, and parts of Minnesota. Its leaders argued, that it did not belong to the United States, it belonged to Virginia. Its leaders argued that Virginia, and here's the important point, could not both be a republic and govern territory of that scale. They had to give it up. The Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation. <laughs> so they decided to give this territory in treaty to the Confederation, on the understanding that it would be divided through secession into smaller states, or into states. Uh, and because of this, Virginia came to be known as, quote, the mother of states. States become pregnant, and you give birth to little republics. <laughs> and Big Mama Virginia poured forth from her lap a number of states. But Virginia was still too large for Republican government, as classically understood. The solution again was secession. Once filled with population, the western counties of Virginia seceded and formed the state of Kentucky. Western counties of North Carolina seceded and formed the state of Franklin, which failed, but out of it came the state of Tennessee. Maine seceded from Massachusetts and so on. You see the point. Split and divide in the direction of a more humane scale of self-government in the direction of republicanism. And at the end of that would be the, the polity of 200,000, or a federation of such polities. But Jefferson thought Virginia, even without Kentucky, was too large for self-government. It's not too large for an empire, for a monarchy, but for self-government it is. So he proposed dividing it into small republics which he called ward republics. These would have sovereignty over local affairs in a manner similar to the small Swiss uh, republics. Um, uh, of such a state, federated little republics, Jefferson wrote to John Cartwright in 1824, quote, that the wit of man cannot devise a more solid basis for a free, durable, well-administered republic, end quote. You've got to divide it into competing jurisdictions. We need a little market in governments. But great pressure would now, listen to this, great pressure was put on this Jeffersonian solution to the problem of, of reconciling republicanism with large scale by the Louisiana Purchase, which more than doubled the territory. Oh, God, well, if, if the original territory was too big, now we're really asking for it. That's where we get Missouri. Well, this immediately sparked secession movements in New England and New York. And these went on from 1804 to 1814, when it was got to be very serious in 1814 with the Hartford Convention. The Federalists thought that Virginians were out to create an agricultural empire at the expense of their commercial, financial, and manufacturing interests. And they didn't want this territory. They threatened secession. 
Jefferson tried to calm them down by saying, yes, America will become an empire, but not a centralized empire. It will become what he called, quote, an empire of liberty. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he meant something like this. It would be, it would be a decentralized civilization uh, uh, likened to that of the ancient Greeks, but on a larger scale. For example, um, as Americans ventured toward the Pacific, they would reenact the primal scene of the English colonists. They would clear the forests, build societies, and when strong enough, would form states. And in time, these states would have different interests, and they would secede and form uh, a n number of federations. Jefferson wrote to Joseph Priestley, January 29, 1804, that he would be happy to see a, quote, Mississippi Confederacy alongside the old Atlantic Confederacy. And he imagined a Pacific Federation comprised of, quote, free and independent Americans, unconnected with us, but by the ties of blood and interest, and employing like us the rights of self-government. Okay. So to be an American, you don't have to have a centralized regime. You could have three federations, each an American federation, and you would have an American identity, but it would not be under a Hobbesian centralized regime, just like you can be, um, but anyway, that, that was his vision. Now, what's interesting and what I think we tend to forget is that the Jeffersonians pretty much dominated American politics from 1800 um, to 1861. In other words, this view was fairly mainstream until the Civil War. Consequently, it was common during this period to think of secession as an essential part of Republican liberty. For example, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri told the sentence, Senate, Senate, in 1825, quote, in planting the seed of a new power on the coast of the Pacific Ocean, it should be well understood that when strong enough to take care of itself, the new government should separate from the mother empire as the child separates from the parent at the age of manhood, end quote. See, see the Aristotelian way of thinking? This is just natural. This is what will, should and will naturally happen. It's just too big to be ruled from the center. Historian Daniel Borston observes, and I quote, Jefferson propagandized for an independent Pacific Federation. <clears throat> and in the 1820s, many leading Americans, including Albert Gallatin, James Monroe, William Crawford, Henry Clay, Thomas Hart Benton, your own senator, and possibly James Madison shared the vision, end quote. Borson continues that the Jeffersonian vision of the United States as a planter of new nations had an appeal we have long forgotten, end quote. Jeffersonians sometimes imagine a natural division of America into an Atlantic Federation, a Mississippi Federation, and a Pacific Federation. You see, each, each on its own water route. but forming a common market, perhaps, and a kind of NATO defense alliance or something of that sort. <clears throat> so when 11 American states actually did secede in 1861 to form a federation of their own, they were not guilty of treason, as Lincoln said they were. They can be seen as acting in accord uh, with the Aristotelian, Althusian, Jeffersonian conception of Republican liberty. It is interesting that Lincoln gave a Hobbesian justification for forcing those states back into the Union. He said in his first inaugural, as one of his main reasons, quote, the essence of secession is anarchy, end quote. And that's a theorem right out of Hobbes, not that he read Hobbes. <clears throat> to sum up, we have examined four levels of Aristotelian Republicanism in respect to size. 
the classical Aristotelian Republic of 200,000 or less, the Althusian Federation of Small Republics of medium size, Switzerland, and David Hume's large federative republic, the size of France, and finally, Jefferson's empire of liberty in which you have a Connell scale of a federation of sovereign states, which are republics. But they all, though differing greatly in size and scale, all of these visions are Aristotelian because they have one thing in common, namely the privileging of small-scale republics and a market competition between republics. So they all have that dimension. The subatomic physics of the Jeffersonian Federation is the little ward republic in Virginia. And Virginia is federated with other sta states, and Virginia can divide if it gets too big, and so on. Everybody see that? So there's an Aristotelian style here. <clears throat> well, what's going to prevent these uh, increasingly large republics from uh, the central government uh, 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 absorbing uh, too much power and uh, sucking out the republican life of the constituents? Uh, how are you going to stop that? Well, there are only two ways. Um, uh, one is, well, sorry, in the, in the Aristotelian tradition, there are two ways. One is some sort of veto. The Constitution would have a veto, so the little republic could veto a legislation that would be harmful. The other would be secession. It could just actually leave. And this would be a lawful act, as Althusius has. It would be lawful. It wouldn't be treason, or it would just decide to leave. And the reason it can do that is because it is a self-governing polity. It doesn't actually have to be in the republic. It can exist outside the republic or join another uh, state. So in the, in the Aristotelian tradition, some sort of corporate veto or corporate secession would be the remedies to, uh, to tyrannical centralization. Now, in the Hobbesian uh, vision of republicanism, because there is a Hobbesian vision of republicanism. I mean, China uh, may be a republic, but it's a Hobbesian republic. Um, it's not an Aristotelian republic, because there's not going to be nullification or secession. So how could you have a Hobbesian um, republic? Well, I think that David Hume gives us a model of, republic, of a republic that could be, could be fitted into the Hobbesian scheme. And I want to talk now about David, in the time that remains, I want to talk about David Hume's uh, theory of a um, large republic. Again, 1752, in an essay titled, Idea of a Perfect Commonwealth. This, this had an influence on Madison, at least they read it. Madison and Hamilton read it. Uh, they didn't follow the, the idea, but they did read it. I think it gave them some inspiration because they were worried about whether America could be a republic since this, this territory was so large. Hume asked us to consider <clears throat> um, a country the size of Britain or France. And he's going to divide it into 100 small republics. Each of these are divided into 100 parishes. So we have 100 legislatures, little republics, and each of those are divided into 100 parishes. Those in the parish meet annually to elect a representative to their small republic. Let's say Missouri is, is the state. Missouri has 100 uh, republics in it, um, and each has 100 parishes. So you go to the local high school uh, or church once a year, and you elect one representative in your little parish to be in your republic, which might be the size of a county in, in, in Missouri. So you'll have 100 legislators in your little uh, county republic. Now, this legislature elects a senator to represent that republic uh, in the um, capital, uh, which is um, Columbia. No, Jeff Jefferson. Sorry, Jefferson. Jefferson. Um, okay, so we'll have 100 senators in Jefferson, right? And it also elects 10 of its members, the Little Republic does, to, 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 to do the executive and judicial, to carry out the judicial and executive functions. And the 100 senators, they elect 10 to carry out the executive and judicial functions of the whole state of Missouri. 
Now, in normal, okay, I can't, don't have time to go into Hume's uh, constitution. It's very complicated. But normally, the Senate proposes legislation. And they send it down to the little republics for ratification. Go to 100 republics. And each republic gets one vote, regardless of population. Um, and a majority of republics, they ratify it. It's law. Now, to, to, be, to, check, to check the Hobbesian fear, uh, I'm calling this a Hobbesian republic because Hume does not talk about secession. He doesn't say these states can't secede. He just assumes that that's not going to happen, as in Switzerland. You just assume the cantons aren't going to secede. So this is, this is as it were, an indivisible state. And I think it, you know, Hume might allow secession, but let's just assume that that's understood that you're not going to have that. Now, he's arranged this thing in such a way that secession is never going to be needed because there's so much liberty and so many protections in this Constitution that why, why would you ever want to secede? That, that's the whole idea of it. And that's the way Switzerland is. Switzerland, the, the Italian sections of Switzerland and the German have, sections have many times had the opportunity to be part of Italy or part of France or part of Germany. They don't want to be. They speak Italian, they speak German, they speak French, but they don't want to be part of Italy. They like being Italian, but they don't want to be part of Italy under Rome. So you can be Italian and be, uh, you know, not under Rome. <clears throat> so this is how Hume is thinking about it, I think. Okay, now let's look at Hume's ratio of representation to population because we don't have republican government unless we have self-government, unless the people in some meaningful sense make the laws they live under, under the rule of law. Let's look at Hume's ratio. Uh, his Senate has 100 senators, as does the United States. And I want to compare this with the United States. But his national representative body is divided into 100 legislatures sitting in 100 republics. And that yields 10,000 representatives. 10,000 representatives. Now, Hume's Britain had around 9 million people, yielding one ratio, sorry, yielding a ratio of one representative for every 900 people. Well, that's beginning to sound like Platonic and Aristotelian self government. Now contrast that with the U.S. House of Representatives, which with a population of 315 million people contains only 435 representatives. So Hume gives you 10,000 representatives. We have only 435. And his 10,000 represent 9 million people. And our 435 represent 315 million. By mid-century in the United States, it may well be, around mid-century, 435 million people, which means we would have one representative for every million persons. And by the end of the century, according to the Census Bureau, we might even have a billion. So something doesn't smell right in the milk here. I don't know what it is, but let's think about it. Well, what's the solution? Could we increase the size of the house beyond 435? No, not really, uh, because the current size is about right for a lawmaking body. Look around the world. The largest uh, legislative body is, is, is the house is, part, is Britain with 600 or something, but most of them are 200, 300, 400. Well, what would be the right ratio of representation to population of of representation to population. Madison said it should be one for every 30,000 people. That's republicanism, he thought. Well, let's don't argue about it. Let's just accept that for the moment. He has some authority. You know, We should pay attention to that. Well, if we had Madison's ratio, in the House today, there would be 10,500 members in the House. That's too big for a lawmaking body in one place. Or let's look at the problem in another light. 
Suppose our ratio of one representative every 725,000 were applied to the first Congress in 1789. Some people have told me, well, there's nothing wrong with our ratio because we have modern technology and communication. We can travel. Rep representation is a human thing, and it's limited by the, by the eyes, the nose, the ears, the human face. It doesn't change. Technology doesn't change that at all. To see this, let us take out, let's say, okay, this is pretty good. Well, let's apply it to the first Congress. If we did that, there would be only five members in the House. So each state would have one representative, but eight states would have none. So they wouldn't really have adequate representation, and that means we don't have adequate representation because that's the ratio we're living on. So there's nothing wrong with Madison's ratio. Our ratio fails today by our standards, not by Madison's. Or look at it another way. If we had Hume's scheme, there would be one representative for every 30,000 people in America today, which is about Madison's ratio. If we had Hume's... Uh, in other words, if the House of Representatives were broken up and put as federal legislatures in the various states. <clears throat> now, Hume's uh, structure would greatly reduce the possibility of corruption and runaway centralization at the national level. Uh, to appreciate this, we, and then we've seen a number of papers on uh, how unbelievably corrupt and venal um, uh, that center of... Uh, government is in Washington. But to appreciate this a little more fully, let's consider that a lawmaking majority of both houses of Congress today, that's both houses, is only 268 people. And if a quorum is used, it could be as low as 135. This small number rules 315 million people and spent last year nearly $4 trillion, an amount greater than the entire gross national product of Germany. Never in human history has so much financial power been put in the hands of so few. In no empire has that ever happened. And this in a regime that calls itself Republican, with self-government. With trillions of dollars sitting in one place, it is relatively easy to corrupt a lawmaking majority of only 268 congressmen, or if a quorum is used 135. But corruption would be extremely difficult if the House of Representatives were expanded to 10,000 members hmm, and placed in federal legislatures in each state. So each state would have 100. Missouri would have 100. Iowa would have 100. Idaho would have 100, and so on. Think of what the lobbyists would have to do. Instead of merely walking from one building in Washington to another and talking to a few key people, perhaps with some doxies on the side um, and, and, uh, and all the other business, uh, they, they would have to travel to 100 states, because Hume is going to, if we do Hume, we have to divide the states. Instead of 50, we'll have 100, right? They'd have to travel to 100 states and convince 5,100 legislators for the pork spending. It's going to benefit Ohio. <laughs> Try that. Now, not only that, but these legislators, think about who they are. They're living cheek by jowl in the neighborhoods of their constituents. And these people are school teachers, homemakers, businessmen, Joe the plumber, um, and other types. <laughs> Uh, that have been elected in these disgusting parish meetings that meet annually. Annually. Try to convince them. Okay, Obamacare was one of the largest pieces of legislation ever passed in Congress. If the public knew what was in the bill, as they are beginning to know now, it never would have passed. There's no question about that. It never would have passed. 
It was rushed through without being seriously examined or even read by many, as, 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 as a number of congressmen said. They hadn't read it. It was passed through deceit. Now, let's just say that honestly. And I'm not even criticizing Obamacare. I'm just saying it might have been a good bill. But I don't think Congress had the authority to even pass it. But even if it was a good bill, it was passed through deceit. And that tells you something about the quality of representation in Washington today. That's the quality of Republican representation we have. It's no better than that. In Hume's Republic, Obamacare would be sent by the Senate to the representatives dispersed in the legislatures of Montana, South Carolina, Idaho, North Dakota, Georgia, and so on. Uh, where each state has one vote. It is certain that these local representatives, always jealous of their liberty and suspicious of, you know, those people far away, are they able to give that bill a reading, don't you think? Oh, yes, and a hard reading. Its defeat would be so certain that it never would have been proposed by the Senate. It never would have been proposed. They got. It, I mean, they have other things to do and things that are absolutely absurd. But the total absence of Republican representation in Congress today is not the worst of it, because most of the laws and regulations we live under are not passed by Congress at all, but flow from the vast and penetrable bureaucracy under the control of one man, the president. <clears throat> And the most important social policy matters, such as gay marriage, religion in the schools, etc., are under the control of nine unelected, politically well-connected lawyers. How's that for defining the fundamental institutions of, of culture and civilization? Marriage. Never mind what you think about marriage. It's always been at the center of every society. Jean Baptiste Vico, the first philosopher to work out a theory of human culture, said mankind moves from the animal to the human when he invents three institutions religion, burial, and marriage. If you don't have those, you, you don't have the fully human. You don't have human culture. But that's going to be decided not by what you think. Probably it's going to be decided by the court. I hate to be rather cynical, but it looks like that's what's going to happen. So you might ask yourself, how did these Republican people ever get themselves in this fix? OK. Um, The United States today is not within light years of being a Republican polity. It's certainly not an Aristotelian style Republican polity, and it's not a Hobbesian style Republican polity, because that sort of polity would be like David Hume's polity. In other words, the Hobbesian regime would be indivisible, right? I mean, in other words, there's not anything you want to divide, and there's no constitutional mechanism for division. But the rules will be rigged in such a way as to give the constituent republics such a freedom of self-government that they wouldn't want us to see, like Switzerland. You know I mean? So I'm going to say Switzerland is a Hobbesian republic in the sense that secession and state nullification are not remedies to tyranny. They have another remedy, which is built into the Hobbesian republic. And it's a Hobbesian republic of medium size. Um, it's not fully Hobbesian because those, those regimes tend to be expansive. So, but I'm, playing, I'm, I'm trying to show you that if you were a Hobbesian, there is a kind of way you could be Republican. But you'd have to rig the rules in such a way as to give a lot of self-government to the units. Um, <clears throat> Switzerland, for example, has, you know, the... With 50,000 signatures, you can put any federal law up to referendum, right? And for 100,000 signatures, you can force a vote on a constitutional amendment. 
Well, I mean, you know, if you have, if you have that kind of freedom, political freedom, then the central government's going to think very carefully about what it does. It's got to deal with a referendum. Um, and in Switzerland, the central government has no original taxing power. It, um, it's given taxing power only through a constitutional amendment, which requires the majority of the cantons and majority of the individuals. And that taxing power is for a certain percentage, whatever they negotiate, work out, hmm? and for a certain period of time, like two years, three years. And then it's over with. And at the end of that time, the central government has no taxing power. And if, if, the, if the Constitution is not amended again, it doesn't have any taxing power. And the cantons just go off on their own. I mean, they don't leave, but they govern themselves. By the way, the Swiss Constitution was modeled on the US Constitution. The Swiss Constitution of 1848 was inspired by the US Constitution as it was in 1858 when the Jeffersonians were controlling things. They stuck to it, we didn't. <clears throat> we had a militia army, they had a militia army, they still do. So the point is you can have a kind of Hobbesian republic that's indivisible, but you've got to really uh, give a considerable liberty to the uh, Republican units. Okay, uh, let me just sum up a few remarks, then we'll stop. Um, uh, well, what I've tried to suggest is when we talk about free markets, we ought to talk about a free market not only in producing and exchanging commodities, but a free market in uh, governments. Uh, and there are a number of ways in which we can do that. The Greek civilization was 1,500 little republics uh, constituting a civilization with no centralization. There are other ways to do this through federations of various kinds, Althusius, Jefferson, David Hume. Uh, but they all have this republican style about them. There are two groups that hate the free market. Marxists and big commercial and financial corporations. Businessmen hate the market. Don't think that businessmen like the free market. Little businessmen do. They tend to like the free market. But big businessmen like to have a marriage between the coercive power of government and their, their economic interests. So there's such a thing as real capitalism, and then there's crony capitalism. <laughs> so, um, so if we had a market in governments, that might help us uh, be free of crony capitalism. <clears throat> okay, the 21st century may well turn out to be to give us an order of small states. I want to end on this idea. When the League of Nations was formed after World War I, only large states were allowed. Now, you've got to remember that there was a time when these big states didn't exist. They really are creatures that come about after the French Revolution. I mean, you have big monarchies before that, but even they are pretty much decentralized. And not, I mean, totally, but I mean, they, they have more decentralization than the modern democracies. Um, Germany, for example, in 1700 was uh, composed of over 200 political states, principalities, around 50 free cities. We've forgotten there was such a thing as a free city. It's a little state. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> over 1,000 titled estates. So Germany was not a state, it was a geographical expression, like Metternich said of Italy. Italy is not a state, it's a geographical expression. It's claiming to be a state, but not really. Uh, so, but uh, after the French Revolution, centralization, centralization, centralization. They get bigger and bigger. The Civil War creates this big monolithic United States, Soviet Union, Germany, Italy. They all do the same thing. They begin to fracture after World War II. Everywhere they're cracking, including the United States. Not as much as others, but. Czechoslovakia has, has, has disappeared. Yugoslavia has disappeared. Soviet Union has disappeared. <clears throat> there will be a vote on secession in Scotland uh, this year. Uh, this very week, as we speak, well, maybe it's, it was over. No, yes, this very week, there is a vote in the Veneto region of Italy, which the media has not talked about, to secede from Italy. Venice is in the Veneto region, so I, it's about three million people. 
And they have long wanted to get out. <laughs> the Lega Nord uh, is a secession movement in Lombardy uh, that's been around a long time, and they have, uh, uh, they have, some, uh, consider they have seats in, in the parliament and so on. So uh, then there's Catalonia, uh, probably next. Uh, in any case, whatever happens, the, there's this centrifugal movement back to smaller scale. Now, just to give you an idea of how the world has changed since World War II, remember the League of Nations, you had to be a big state to be a member. We don't want to see anything called Iceland in there. 300,000 people. But look at it today. Of the states recognized in the world today, over half are 5 million or less. A third are 1 million or less. And the rest are 500,000 or less. 52 states of the 230, 223 recognized, there are 223, 52 of these states are, two, 52 of these states are 100,000 or less, 52, 100,000 or less. 24 are 10,000 or less. Now remember one of the Swiss canton states is 15,000, 10,000 or less. 80 of the 223 nations recognized in the world are smaller in territory than Vermont. That's a third of the nations in the world recognized today are smaller in territory than Vermont. 13 are smaller in land area than Washington, D.C. And one is smaller than the Washington Mall, the Vatican. Yeah. <laughs> Theoretically and practically speaking, there is no reason today why a civilization of small states, similar to that of the ancient Greeks, could not be established with free market competition and governments as well as commodities and exchange. I mean, don't, don't say it can't happen. Don't say you can't have small <laughs> states. Argue with the United Nations. Small states also tend to have a more Republican ratio of representation to population than large states. Just take two. New Hampshire, with 1.3 million people, has 424 representatives. That's one for every 3,000 citizens. That's Republican ratio. That's government of the people, by the people, and for the people. California, which has 38 million, has only 80 representatives in the House. One for every 475,000 members of population. So California, 38 million. New Hampshire, 1.3 million. 80 representatives for the former, uh, 470, um, 424 for the other. New Hampshire is ranked in the top four freest states in the Union, as judged by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, top four freest states, you know, economic freedom, civil liberties, and so on. California and New York are among the lowest. The era of Large Hobbesian states, said to be one and indivisible, billiard ball states, no longer has the authority it once had. People just don't believe it. When I was coming along, nobody questioned this. Nobody talked about secession, except as a four-letter word. Uh, but that has changed. I forgot about Crimea. It no longer has the authority. And the Nobel laureate, Friedrich Hayek, of sainted memory, was probably right when in the 60s he prophesied that liberty in the future might best be preserved in small states. 